I hope um, everybody can um, hear and, and see me and of course um, later see others. Um, well, firstly, a very good afternoon to everybody, good evening, and thank you very much for, for joining us. I, I understand we have over 400 of us um, coming through this um, London Central um, web-based event. I'm very, very pleased, delighted in fact to have Amanda Hardy QC uh, joining us today um, and will be speaking to us all about uh, current inheritance tax issues um, surrounding UK residential property. Before um, we start that, um, just a couple of um, housekeeping points, if I may. Um, you will probably um, see that the chat function um, is disabled uh, for the webinar, but if you do uh, have a question, particularly as we go along, please use the uh, question and answer function at the bottom of the screen, and, and we'll do our level best to um, answer as many of those as, as we can um, before we finish. Um, this whole um, event will be uh, recorded, it's being recorded, and will be available to watch on demand um, from tomorrow, and uh, you'll get an email um, with a link to the recording. Um, Amanda Hardy uh, QC is, is well known to very, very many of us, and um, from Five Stone Buildings, having taken silk in uh, 2015, um, and is one of our, our leading practitioners, as I'm sure many of you well know, um, both um, as an advisory um, barrister in, in the field of private client and corporate tax, as well as um, litigation. Um, Amanda is the author of International Guide to the Taxation of Trusts and, and of the second edition of Tolly's Statutory Residence Test, and also, I think, is in an unassailable pole position for the 2020 London Central Branch Best Friend Award. And um, we are very grateful for all that Amanda Hardy has done and, and will be doing. So, um, nothing, uh, nothing more from me at this stage. Um, Amanda, with grateful thanks, I'm going to uh, mute myself, that's the most important thing, stop my video, that's equally important, and hand over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and operate that. Still takes me a moment. Apologies, everyone. Well, welcome everyone um, to um, Inheritance Tax a residential property update, which is what I've been asked to speak about today. Um, you'll see, and I hope everyone can see the slides, um, there uh, are a number of topics I'm going to cover. We can't cover everything in relation to residential property um, in, in this session, um, but I've been asked to touch on the following issues. I mean, firstly, I'm going to give a very brief introduction, and then in relation to UK domiciliary planning with the family home, we're going to look first at the residence nil rate band three years on and what's happening there. Then we're going to look a little bit at past planning, some of the schemes that some of us will uh, remember and how we unwind those structures if we find that we're still with them. Uh, and particularly, we're going to look at the home loan scheme uh, because there's an update there, there's been a recent case. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, DOTAS for inheritance tax advantages particularly with residential property in mind, um, because I think that's an important thing to take into consideration when advising clients at the moment. And finally, I'm just going to do a little um, very brief update um, in relation to foreign domiciliaries and where we are uh, with foreign domiciliaries and residential property at the moment. So firstly, it, it, by way of introduction, I wanted to talk a little bit about the changing landscape um, and obviously, um, inheritance tax planning has to go hand in hand with capital gains tax planning as well and capital gains tax um, issues uh, that they have to be looked at together um, because one doesn't want to make an inheritance tax saving and find that one has an increased or a new CGT charge. And in that arena, there is some real change afoot at the very least um, that, that clients need to be aware of. Uh, and I've put on the slide um, three specific um, reports that have, have come out or are coming out, which I think we need to just be aware of. You're probably all aware that the Office for Tax Simplification um, produced its first report in November um, last month, 2020. Um, and, and they are reviewing 
uh, CGT as a whole and looking at um, the whole of, uh, of capital gains tax for the purposes of simpli simplification. And there have been a number of suggestions uh, that it's worth noting. Um, firstly, the recommendations include, uh, and these are a number of separate recommendations, and not necessarily all of them or any of them will be implemented, um, but it's worth knowing about them. Firstly, there's a suggestion that capital gains tax rates may be aligned more significantly with income tax rates. And of course, that's, that's a very important matter for clients because there's quite a differential in, in the rates at the moment. There's also a recommendation to lower um, the annual allowance, which obviously will have an impact for clients. Uh, for specific clients, and I do quite a lot of work um, for hedge funds, there are some further um, recommendations in relation to carried interest being taxed as income rather than as capital in circumstances where it is capital at the moment. So clients will want to have an eye on that if they're within that arena. And there's also um, talk of reforming or abolishing the unfortunately named now BAD relief, the B-A-D-R relief, which um, was known as entrepreneur's relief. Uh, obviously that has been significantly curtailed uh, in any event, but there is talk of, of reform or abolition. But the most important one I think for our purposes is the suggestion that, that the capital gains tax uplift on death should be abolished. And obviously that's going to feed in to any inheritance tax planning. So it, it's definitely worth knowing that that's, that's out there. The second, um, the second report that I'm just going to mention comes out tomorrow, good timing. That's the Wealth Tax Commission's report on a general wealth tax. Um, for my own purposes, I suspect that we're probably uh, not likely to end up with a wealth tax, um, but let's see what the report says tomorrow and how the government picks up on it. And finally, you'll probably all have heard that last year there was a more radical suggestion by the all-party parliamentary group for inheritance and intergenerational fairness, it's quite a mouthful for a com committee's name, um, that they have suggested replacing the entire current inheritance tax regime with a flat rate gift tax, um, which would be payable on both lifetime and death transfers at a rate of, of 10%. Uh, and part of that would involve the abolition of all reliefs other than spouse and charity exemptions. And again, they suggested that the tax-free capital gains tax uplift on death should be abolished. So I think that, that we have a warning from, from two different angles, if I can put it like that, that that may well be something that's, that's going to be on the cards. The, um, the all party parliamentary group recommendation also suggested that we have a, a death allowance similar to the nil rate band, uh, but no suggestion in relation to the um, residential um, nil rate, the residential property rate band, which we'll come on to talk about. Um, but they wanted to ensure that, that small estates would, would be un, unaffected. And there was also a suggestion of an annual lifetime allowance of £30,000 on gifts. But I think that the, the general lesson from these, as I said at the beginning, is that we, we may have a changing landscape. So it's going to be worthwhile um, making sure that we keep an eye on current developments. So then moving on to UK domiciliary planning with the UK home, um, in relation to history, as I've said, I'm going to come back in, in, in a moment to look at some of the historic schemes and how the landscape um, developed uh, and how we can wind them up, what we can think about um, what, when we need to wind them up if they no longer serve their purpose. Um, but I'd start with a note of caution. Um, I advise clients always to never let what I call the tax tail wag the practical dog. And I think this is particularly vital in relation to the family home. It, it's, in my view, um, an asset of last resort for planning purposes, because there is really something to be said for clients having somewhere that is entirely within their own estate, entirely their own, uh, and for which they know that they've got untrammeled access for the rest of their life. So I, I think it really is rather um, a, a last resort um, in relation to wider planning. And then, as I've mentioned, um, I, I would always advise what I call safe inheritance tax planning. Uh, and that now in this day and age involves things that come within specific provisions. And we're going to come back to DOTAS 
um, and the current landscape and what sort of things um, may be caught by um, those provisions. So the safe inheritance tax planning uh, certainly in my view includes the residence nil rate band and I've been asked to give an update on that so I'm going to turn to that now um, first. So as I'm sure you're all aware um, clients can save as much as £140,000 in inheritance tax terms when the family home passes to children um, on death. The, the residence nil rate ban was introduced in April 2017, hence the three years on, um, and it's in addition to the individual's own nil rate band of 325,000. It's conditional on the, it being the main residence and it being passed down to direct descendants, for example, children and grandchildren. But from 2021, so from this tax year, families are now in the position to fulfill the, the policy which was um, behind the introduction of the residence nil rate band, which is to save up to um, a million pounds uh, of inheritance tax on their wealth. Um, so each parent will have a nil rate band of 325,000 plus a residence nil rate band of up to 175,000. Hence the total cumulative uh, 1 million pounds uh, worth of, of inheritance tax free um, assets. Um, I should note that these are the maximum amounts. Um, the available allowance will obviously be reduced if the value of the property is, is less than the, um, the, the relief allows. And I've given an example here, for example, if a mother dies in 2021 and gifts her 50% her share in the family home to her children and it's valued for example at 140,000, the extra 35,000 of nil rate band uh, will go unused in her estate but may be transferred to her widower if, if that's the fact pattern um, in relation to this gift. So when can it be transferred? I mean, it's transferable between spouses and civil partners on death, much like um, the standard nil rate band. It, it doesn't apply to cohabitees. So again, obviously know your client. Um, uh, we have to understand what, what the relationship um, status is for our clients before we can advise on this. Uh, and it's worth remembering that it's the unused percentage of the residence nil rate band from the estate of the first to die, which is then claimed on the second death. And this is irrespective of when the first death occurred or whether they owned the residential property at their death. So we're always in a position where we have two people, um, a married couple, that there'll be an additional 100% residence nil rate band in the second spouse's estate, unless the first spouse's estate was greater um, than two million pounds. And that brings me on to um, the tapering restrictions in relation to the residence nil rate band. Clients with really large estates uh, may not see any benefit from the extra nil rate band that, that, that was brought in in 2017. On its introduction, it reduced by one pound for every two pounds that the deceased net estate exceeded two million, which meant that on its introduction, there was no residence nil rate band available if the deceased held assets of more than 2.2 million pounds. So for those high net worth clients, the residence nil rate band may not um, provide them with any additional relief and therefore may not be in point. Um, the, this rose, this sum rose to assets of 2.35 million in 2020-21. So we're now up to the absolute maximum limit in relation to both the relief and the, the restrictions. Uh, there, there's going to be some index linking going forward, but this is the position for this particular year. As I've said, reliefs uh, such as business property relief and agricultural property relief are ignored when calculating the value of the estate. So when looking at our individual client circumstances, in marginal cases where we have an estate that isn't too much over the two million pound taper threshold, we can ensure that we don't lose the residence nil rate band due to these taper restrictions by either making lifetime gifts, and that includes even pets made within seven years of death, or the use of a general um, nil rate band trust on the death of the first to die. So these are two ways of making sure that estates that just come over the two million pound um, uh, or 
2.2 million and then now 2.35 million limits um, still qualify for the relief. It's worth just remembering that unlike the general nil rate ban that everyone has, the resident nil rate ban is only available to reduce inheritance tax on death. And it's not available to be set against inheritance tax on lifetime gifts or, or failed pets. So it only operates in that arena. So who can benefit from it? I've already mentioned, it's only available when the main residence passes to children. Uh, that includes um, adopted, foster, or stepchildren or linear descendants um, on death and their spouses or, or civil partners. Um, but the one key thing to take care of is the fact that the residence nil rate band can be lost and will be lost, for example, if the property is put into a general discretionary will trust for the benefit of the children or the grandchildren. We'll come on to variations um, in a moment. But if the trust gives a child or a grandchild an absolute interest or an interest in possession in the home, an IPDI, an immediate post-death interest, then you still can claim the residence nil rate band uh, and it can give you the flexibility to make some protection um, that, that trusts can give in relation to the devolution of estates, the practical protection of not necessarily giving children an interest um, too early, for example. Um, other trusts also qualify, the, the, the niche trusts such as bereaved minor trusts, 18 to 25 trusts and disabled persons trusts also um, uh, retain the nil rate, the residence nil rate band. So, so they're the people who can benefit. Well, a question that's all, all often asked is what happens if I, I want to sell my home or if I have to sell my home, for example, to go into um, nursing care, uh, what happens then? Um, the good news is the family home doesn't need to be owned at death to qualify. Downsizing relief was, was brought in as a rather late addition to the provisions. Um, it's important, obviously, um, not just as I've said for people who've sold their property, um, but where you've moved in, somebody's moved into residential care or indeed even into a relative's home. But there are some conditions to, to still fulfil in order to continue to benefit from the residence nil rate band. The first is the property disposed of had to be owned by the individual and it had to have qualified for the residence nil rate band had the individual retained it. Uh, and secondly, the replacement property, if you've replaced it, or the assets that, that were the product of the sale need to form part of the estate and pass to the descendants under the terms of the will. The downsizing or disposal must take place after the 8th of July 2015, so that was the, um, that, that's the cutoff date going back, but there is no time limit on the period between the disposal and when the death occurs, so that's um, good news in relation to those provisions. One other area that I've seen on a number of occasions that I think it's, it's definitely worth highlighting is um, the position of joint tenants. Um, some clients may miss out on being able to utilise the residence nil rate band by not ensuring that their estates are he held in the most effective way from the property law perspective. And, and many clients still hold um, family homes as joint tenants. As I'm sure you're all aware, where you have a joint tenancy on the first death, this means the house passes to the surviving spouse, the surviving owner, with no inheritance tax because of the spouse exemption. Um, that leads to the conclusion that the residence nil rate ban therefore is not used on the first death with the surviving spouse inheriting the full unused allowance. If the combined estate then on the second death, however, is greater than 2.35 million because of the tapering restrictions, then we could lose both of the spouses residence nil rate bans um, because of that tapering, um, that, that tapering restriction. So it's important to make sure that we understand whether or not our clients hold as joint tenants or tenants in common. And if you do have a joint tenancy, it may well be advisable to sever the joint tenancy to then allow each spouse to control how the property passes on death. And that'll potentially preserve their entitlements to the residence nil rate band, 
by keeping each partner's assets below the 2.35 million um, upper limit. Uh, and by way of example, on the first death, the deceased could use their own residence nil rate band by leaving part of the share in the family home to their children. And in turn, this would reduce the value of the survivor's net estate. This could then be further reduced if the deceased gives away more up to their ordinary nil rate band to bring, to bring down the um, estate for tapering. And in total, the survivor's estate could then be reduced by up to 500,000. So this is a very, I think, um, important point just to note um, in relation to how the property interests are held. So coming on to drafting um, in, in the wills, obviously wills need to be considered and reviewed regularly. Obviously they need to be drafted with residents uh, nil rate ban gifts potentially um, being in point if the factual matrix um, allows for that. Um, and it's worth just reflecting, first of all, on cases where a specifically drafted residents nil rate ban gift may not be needed. And there are a number of those, and then we'll go on to look at where it, it's usually needed. I mean, the first is obviously if the estate is not otherwise chargeable. Um, this, for example, if the estate comes under the general nil rate band after allowing for any transferable nil rate band, and for example, the inheritance tax charity exemption is in point. Um, the second is if the testator is married, because it may be better to pass the estate to the surviving spouse or to a trust under which she has an IPDI. That may well be, um, that may well be better in certain factual circumstances. Um, thirdly, if the residual estate is passing to close family or to a trust under which they have an IPDI, because that may well um, then scoop up the residence nil rate band itself. And again, if the estate is sufficiently large, that taper reduces the residence nil rate band to nil. Uh, and that, that applies in short to estates over 2.7 million. So it may be that, that no specific drafting will, will assist in those cases. Um, in, my, in my experience, the most common case where, where a residence nil rate band gift is needed is where the residuary estate passes to the testator's unmarried um, partner or cohabitee. In those circumstances, the resident nil rate band gift may be made obviously to close family, children, descendants and spouses, absolutely, or as we've discussed, um, to a trust under which close family have an interest in possession. And in that case, the interest may in principle be revoked after death. Um, and the property transferred to others, including the cohabitee. But great care has to be taken in relation to um, both the, the DOTAS rules that I'm going to come on to discuss. And indeed, um, if things were made um, uh, or effected in very short order, the general purposive construction of the um, courts, um, I'm thinking of the, of the cases that follow on from the Ramsey principle and um, the general anti-avoidance rule. So these have to be um, quite carefully thought about. Um, another case where a residence nil rate band gift is needed is where the testator or the testator's spouse already has a double um, uh, residence nil rate band. And that can happen obviously if they had a previous marriage and they already have inherited um, a residence nil rate band. So finally, in relation to the residence nil rate band, um, just don't forget about variations. I mentioned them earlier. Um, Post-death variations passing a residential interest to qualifying descendants can obviously attract the residence nil rate band as long as all the other requirements are satisfied for a variation, because obviously there's reading back under uh, section 142. Uh, for inheritance tax purposes and indeed um, for, for capital gains tax purposes as well. Just remember that post-death post variations um, don't change the general law position and they can't affect the income tax position um, and also they have to be affected within two years of the death of the deceased but certainly you can um, utilize section 142 to make sure that you make full use of the residence nil rate band. And similarly, if you have a discretionary trust, a section 144 discretionary settlement, um, it won't qualify um, for the residence nil rate band on death, even if the, the descendants are, uh, the beneficiaries are lineal descendants. However, utilizing section 144, which has a very similar readback provision to section 142, means that an appointment that's made under, uh, within two years of death 
to descendants can be read back into the will. And so the trustees can retrospectively secure the residence nil rate band for the estate. So uh, uh, as far as I can see, the residence nil rate band um, provisions are, are working effectively. Um, drafting has to be obviously um, carefully undertaken. Uh, we have to know our clients to make sure that we um, have the right factual matrix. We also have to understand whether or not their property interests are aligned with allowing uh, the maximum utilization of the residence nil rate band. Um, but it's certainly working in the way I think that the government intended. Um, I, I'm not going to labour this point, but I'm sure everyone will agree um, that for what actually probably has turned out to be a relatively limited uh, amount of benefit, the provisions obviously are incredibly complex um, to have sort of uh, a number of pages of, of legislative content just to get to a £1 million um, exemption. Um, and the, the levels of complexity, um, I, I think, are probably regrettable. Um, but we've got to the stage now, I think, where we're, we're understanding how it's working. So that's the residence nil rate band. And then I was asked just to touch on past planning uh, and unwinding structures. Um, and some of you will be familiar, um, obviously, with um, the various different types of, of arrangement that um, were undertaken, I'd say, pre-2003 in relation to inheritance tax planning with the family home. Um, Ingram and HMRC was a, a notable case um, in 1999. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be um, junior counsel for Lady Ingram's executors in that case. And um, it certainly was a, a very satisfying win in the House of Lords. Um, it involved um, Lady Ingram carving out a lease in her freehold property um, and then giving away the freehold reversion for the benefit of her family. Um, and there were, there were quite a few issues that were obviously pertinent to this, um, but the most important one um, was the application of the gifts with reservation of benefit provisions, the GROB provisions. Um, and, and satisfyingly, the House of Lords held 5-0 um, that the planning uh, worked. Uh, they said, and I, I love Lord Hoffman's quote um, in this relation, um, he said, uh, in carving out a lease and giving away the freehold reversion, Lady Ingram wasn't having her cake and eating it. She was ca carefully carving up her cake, eating part and giving away the rest. Obviously, um, HMRC were disappointed. Um, and as a result, we had the provisions that were enacted um, in, in the Finance Act 1999, which in, introduced section 102A into the Finance Act 1986. Uh, which obviously was intended um, to take away the effectiveness of the uh, Lady Ingram um, lease carve out type arrangements. Um, I always, um, I was always um, curious, I've never see a, seen a client do it, um, as to whether or not if you had a very young client um, uh, and people who were very patient, um, in fact, the Lady Ingram scheme still worked, um, if you were happy to wait seven years uh, uh, after you'd carved out your lease and another seven years to give away your freehold because there's a seven year limit in relation to that. Um, but as I said, I'm, I've not ever seen anyone who's, who's wanted to take that, take that, um, that long uh, view. Um, also, obviously, and I've put this on the slide, um, because other arrangements had, had arisen, we then had the pre-owned assets tax introduced in 2005, which made uh, many of the planning arrangements um, themselves very, um, very um, much less uh, desirable because there was an income tax charge, even if your inheritance tax planning uh, worked. Um, in relation to the Ingram schemes, um, there are a number of, of different um, ways of, of dealing with it. Um, one could pay the, the pre-owned assets tax, ensure the donor ceased to occupy the property, uh, made sure the donor paid uh, rent um, under, under the exemption that's in, in the schedule um, to, sec to the Finance Act 1986. You could rather depressingly opt back into the gifts with reservation of benefit rules that you were trying to get out of um, by undertaking the, the Lady Ingram arrangements, or you could buy back the freehold, which of course then came within your estate as well. Um, so uh, there, were, there are various um, methods um, if you do come across any um, Lady Ingram schemes that are still um, extant to, to sort of unwinding um, and, and um, starting again. Um, reversion release schemes involved something slightly different and they, they sort of I think sprung up while the Lady Ingram legislation was making its way through the courts 
because it went to the High Court and then the Court of Appeal before it went on to the House of Lords. And that involved um, transactions which were uh, almost the other way around. Um, what, what happened there is that a client um, would grant a lease to donees, but the lease wouldn't start immediately. The lease would start in, say, 20 years' time. And uh, the client would then occupy the property, not on the back of the, of the lease that they'd carved out, but on the back of the freehold reversion that they've re retained subject to the carved out um, lease. Um, there um, obviously was a question as to whether or not these were caught by section 102A themselves. There were some arguments that they were depending on the timing and the seven year period. Um, but obviously we had pre-owned assets tax as well. But I'll come back to reversionary lease schemes um, in, in a little while when we come on to um, discuss um, the DOTAS arrangements. So then we had Eversden which was another decision in, in 2003 of the Court of Appeal. In that case, Mrs. Everston had settled her family home on trust to hold it for 5% absolutely for her, um, and then 95% on trusts settled for her husband, um, and he had a life interest in that. Um, and the remainder was held on discretionary trusts under which she was a beneficiary. In that particular case, the ha house happened to be sold and there was a replacement property and a bond purchased. But again, um, HMRC considered that the gifts of reservation of benefit provisions applied. And again, the Court of Appeal unanimously decided that they didn't in this case, um, because there was a specific exemption in section 1025, um, which gave spouse exemption in these types of arrangements. Those arrangements were then stopped um, by the Finance Act 2003, and there were new provisions brought into Section 102, 5A to C um, of the Finance Act um, to stop that. Um, unwinding was slightly trickier with Eversden. Um, you could make sure that you avoided a termination of an interest in possession because you had to make sure that was the case, but then you could end the trust and bring it back into the estate. You could, or you could pay the pre-owned assets tax. Um, in most cases, it was disadvantageous to make the election back into the gifts with reservation of benefit provisions. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I haven't seen um, a, a live Everston scheme for a little while. So um, I'm sure that that's something that perhaps is coming to a, an end now. But now onto the home loan schemes or the double trust schemes. Um, and um, before I come on to the nuts and bolts of the, um, of the, uh, home loan double trust scheme. I, I'm just going to mention that, that these can be very fact specific and that is important. The way they were undertaken can be very fact specific. Um, and there were a number of ways to unwind these. And I think that these, these became very popular. And I think a lot of clients have um, out unwound them um, uh, since the revenue indicated their uh, dissatisfaction with them. Um, as I've said on the slide, um, one, of, one of the options was to pay the pre-owned assets tax and or consider paying part of the loan as a balancing exercise. It was possible to unscramble the entire arrangement, but uh, as I said, everything's quite fact specific uh, and some of the uh, loan arrangements uh, would be relevant discounted securities and that, that could cause an additional hiccup. Um, you could then um, assign the benefit of the death to the settlor and rely on double charges relief. Um, you could elect um, in for it to be a reservation of benefit or again, pay rent under a legal obligation. So there are a number of ways of, of unwinding the home loan schemes. Um, but I want to come on just to discuss um, what I've called the nuts and bolts of them. But before then, I just want to mention, um, I, I do think that it was the double trust scheme and it, its popularity. And in fact, um, as I've um, put on the slide, the fact that they were widely marketed as a way to reduce estate planning um, associated with the value of residential property that really, I think, led um, to the revenue and the treasury deciding that inheritance tax planning with the um, bespoke inheritance tax planning with the family home was something that they were going to object to as a matter of principle. Um, and I think the mass marketing particularly, um, uh, when anything hits the Daily Mail, I think we, we need to be alert for our clients to the fact that the revenue are going to um, pay close attention to the schemes. And the home loan scheme seems to be one that the revenue have consistently um, uh, objected to. 
So what, what you had there in relation to the, the home loan schemes, I should probably say, you know, um, full disclosure that I, I did see, I did have some sympathy with the technical arguments that the revenue had in relation to, um, in relation to um, the home loan schemes. I, I certainly uh, didn't think that they were the first port of call when you were looking at bespoke, bespoke planning um, for, um, for residential property even in the days before we had the pre-owned assets tax and the um, legislative changes after Ingram. Um, but first of all, um, looking at what you had to have, um, in fact, you had to have a sale of, of, of the property to a trust for a debt for an IOU, and then a contribution of the debt to a second trust. Uh, typically, there would be an interest in possession in the first trust for the parents, and they would be excluded from the benefit of the second trust, which held the debt, which is um, typically for the benefit of, say, their children. And we finally had a case um, litigated um, in relation to the double trust scheme. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that was decided um, against the taxpayer. And it was Shelford and HMRC in 2020. Now, it's an interesting case for a number of reasons, but the, flat, the planning failed in stark terms um, most particularly on the documents in that case. Um, judge Alexander, who is a part-time um, first-tier tribunal judge and a property specialist um, solicitor, um, said this to start with, I think I've set it out on the slide. During the course of the oral argument, I raised the question of whether the sale agreement, even re when read together with the loan agreement, is a sham gulp for the council for the taxpayers. That's never a promising start um, when the judge thinks that everything's a sham. And he went on to say, I find that neither Mr. Herbert nor Mr. Shelford ever intended that the terms of the sale agreement be honored. And again, that's not a, not a promising start. And with his property law experience, the judge then examined um, section two of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act um, which um, you'll hopefully all remember from your student days, provides that a contract for the sale or other disposition of an interest in land can only be made in writing and um, only by incorporating all the terms which the part parties have expressly agreed. And then the judge held as a matter of fact that the written terms of the loan agreement and the sale agreement didn't reflect the true agreement reached between the parties as to the sale of the house. And, it, and then he said, it must therefore follow that the written documents cannot have sat satisfied section two, because it didn't contain all of the terms governing the sale of the house. And then he went on, unfortunately, to find that um, the documentation, the agreements reached between the parties relating to the sale of the house and the loan were void as a result of the impact of section two because the deed of assignment that, that moved it on to the second trust had nothing to bite on as there, and there were no sale proceeds or loan benefits. So he found that the house formed part of um, Mr. Herbert's estate at his death um, and that the whole 2.95 million must be included um, within his estate. He then said if he was wrong, he went on to suggest that the value of the property remained in the parents' estate, but he also recognised that it was also trust property and would then be subject to tax on the settlor's death as well. Uh, and when this was pointed out, uh, when it was pointed out to him that this may obviously give rise to double taxation, to an element of economic double taxation, um, he, he gave this rather stark warning. Uh, this serves as a warning that the implementation of tax avoidance schemes can sometimes have the consequences of the participants paying more tax than if they'd done nothing. If you play with fire, do not be surprised if your fingers are burnt. Um, that, that's rather strong wording in my view, but um, it's very interesting um, to see the judge um, coming to that conclusion. He also left open the question of other analyses, not just the, the application of section 102 and section 103, as I've earlier mentioned, um, to the dispositions and the sale consideration, but for good measure, whether there were associated operations or whether the Ramsey lines of, of cases and the purpose of construction um, enunciated most recently in, in UBS um, in the Supreme Court were relevant. So there's some warnings there. So the important question here is what can other taxpayers do um, I understand the taxpayers in Shelford aren't appealing, so the property law point is not going to be overturned, the section two point is not going to be overturned, 
But it is, um, of course, um, correct that the first tier tribunal decisions are not binding on other taxpayers um, if they have similar difficulties in relation to section two, um, rectification, of course, is, is another option um, to, uh, to um, deal with the, with the fallout from the transactions, particularly if we think that there's going to be double taxation. In other categories, and I said at the beginning that the home loan schemes are very fact specific and the drafting was very fact specific, the documentation in the vast majority of cases may well be fine. And I understand that there's a new test um, case being taken in this category with um, different documentation. So we may well have um, a decision on the actual um, application of section 102 and 103 in the future without the difficulties um, that, that were raised by the judge in this case in relation to um, sham and void documentation. So that's just by way of um, an update um, on the home loan schemes. So I'm now going to come on briefly to, um, the, to, to just talk a little bit of, about inheritance tax and DOTAS, um, always um, a, a slightly nerve wracking subject um, for clients. Um, as I'm sure you're all well aware, the disclosure of tax um, avoidance schemes legislation was introduced in the Finance Act 2004 in, in part seven. And historically the rules, the hallmarks they're called were targeted at marketed avoidance and covered, for example, things like premium fee type arrangements and arrangements that had to be kept confidential from, from the revenue, the sort of arrangements that I'm anticipating um, are very unlikely to be undertaken um, by members of, of STEP. Um, it's worth just noting um, that recently, in 2019, um, that there, there was some litigation called Hyrax, uh, and the question was raised in, in Hyrax itself, do the disclosure of tax avoidance schemes require tax avoidance? Seems like a perfectly sensible um, question to ask. And um, the first tier tribunal said no. Um, tax avoidance doesn't need to be required to come within the purview of the disclosure of the tax avoidance scheme. It doesn't shut you out before you get to the relevant hallmarks, even if you've got no, no tax avoidance. You then must look at the rules which prescribe what may, must be disclosed. Uh, and specifically, I just want to mention that the inheritance tax hallmark has been amended in 2018, and it's no, now very wide. There are two conditions. It applies to most types of inheritance tax advantage now, and, and the advantage is condition one. And uh, it applies if the advantage is obtained by means of one or more contrived or abnormal steps. Um, and you can see the, the flavor here, I think, of the GAR um, coming into these type of arrangements as well. So what does this mean in, in the context particularly of, of residential property? Um, and we've been obviously looking at that today. Um, in the, the HMRC guidance, they say this, in particular, it can be helpful con to consider whether the economic consequences are as expected. Let's just, just put, a, put, put aside for a moment whose expectation we're, um, we're, we're examining. Um, making a gift presupposes that the donor no longer beneficially owns the gifted property. If the donor is able to enjoy the gifted property in broadly the same way as previously, this might well be an indicator of a disclosable scheme. So I think that is a warning in relation to the gift res reservation of benefit rules that the revenue think that arrangements that are intended to circumvent those rules now um, potentially fall within the disclosure uh, rules. Um, Examples of arrangements that are notifiable and are, um, arrangements that aren't notifiable. The, the, the guidance um, deals with this in three ways. Um, it sets out some general guidance um, on, the, on, the, uh, various, on the inheritance tax hallmark. And then it goes on to look at and give examples of arrangements which the, the revenue consider aren't notifiable. It then gives um, examples, only three examples of arrangements that are notifiable, definitely. And then it gives uh, one that they've put in that not quite sure box, maybe notifiable. And that, that relates to um, property that um, is business, has business property relief and then there's um, a, a sale or, or buyback. Um, that's in the, the not sure um, category. Um, the examples of arrangements that aren't notifiable contain some things that I, 
think are surprising that they're in there. And I, I say they're surprising that they're in there, not because I think that they are um, provocative and should be in the other category, but I'm surprised that they even need a mention. Um, for example, um, making a will is um, within the examples of arrangements that aren't notifiable. Um, so is um, a pet and so is a deed of variation um, within section 142 or 144. And I say that's surprising because standing back and looking at um, tax avoidance, um, and this obviously um, disclosure of tax avoidance um, uh, uh, arrangements, despite what Hyrax said, is in the context of tax avoidance, obviously is, as um, Willoughby uh, taught us, something that um, isn't intended by Parliament. So it's outside of the statutory invitations that are made by the Treasury and HMRC to order your affairs um, in a way that, that's tax efficient. And it seems to me where we have specific spouse exemptions and where we have specific provisions um, to allow for pets and we have specific provisions in relation to a deed of variation, it's rather surprising that that should even need to be, need to be enunciated as not within the DOTAS rules, but, but there we are. There are a couple of specific examples I just want to draw your attention to because they, they um, relate to gifts of land and in particular residential property. Um, and the first one is where um, the donor continues to use the land but pay, pays for consideration for, um, for its use. And you'll see I set out on the slide, um, the, the, um, the guidance concludes that they are arrangements that reduce or avoid the charge to inheritance tax. And they, they, they may reduce it, whether or not they avoid it, it seems to me is, is a moot point where you have a statutory invitation in the Finance Act, um, section 102 um, and in, in the schedule um, to the Finance Act 1986, not to be within the provisions if you pay rent, but that's aside. They decide that it is in fact um, arrangements, but they conclude that even though condition one is met, it's not contrived or abnormal. Um, th they describe them as, as sale and leaseback arrangements are not unusual in either the commercial world or for individuals, for example, equity release. Uh, I'm not sure that's quite the, quite the answer to condition two. As I said, I think it's more the Willoughby line of authorities and the fact that we have a statutory invitation means that we don't have any tax avoidance. So it's not contrived or abnormal, um, but that, that is fine. Uh, and secondly, in example 10, um, a gift of an undivided share of a property, which is subsequently used by both the donor and the donee. Again, there are statutory provisions in section 102B that deal with this. And again, the, the revenue conclude that um, it is arrangements for the purpose of the DOTAS rules, um, but it's not um, contrived or abnormal. They do say, however, and there is a warning at the end of the paragraph, that the analysis might be different where the donor only retained a very small proportion of the property in comparison to their level of occupation. So if you are um, undertaking sharing arrangements within section 102B, um, it's worth um, obviously considering whether or not um, they're, they're, they're reasonable for the purposes of the DOTAS arrangements. And then finally, coming on, Sorry, I've not moved the slides on. I've got carried away, but it's all there. Moving on to something that is definitely notifiable, uh, we come back to the creation of a reversion release. And uh, they decide that their arrangements which avoid um, or reduce a charge to inheritance tax, um, uh, unsurprisingly, but they also conclude um, that, the, that the creation of a reversion release is a contrived or abnormal step. Um, and the tax advantage wouldn't be um, wouldn't be achieved without this contrived or abnormal st abnormal step, and therefore, from the revenues um, view, um, it, it, a reversion release scheme is now disclosable un under the DOTAS and um, provisions. It, it's important to note that the DOTAS falling into the DOTAS provisions obviously has its own, has its own downsides, but the follow on, the follow on um, issues in relation to penalties and in relation to follow things like follower notices, etc, uh, make it very undesirable, in my view, for clients to undertake any planning that they think comes within um, the inheritance tax DOTAS rules. Um, so um, I think that's probably the end of the reversion release scheme. 
I would just mention um, also in relation to DOTAS that you'll probably seen that the, the revenue are increasingly seeking orders as to notif notifiability from the FTT, where um, clients have decided or uh, that, that, that DOTAS doesn't apply or have not necessarily considered the issue. Uh, and as I've mentioned, and um, the consequences for non-disclosure can be severe, including penalties for scheme users and promoters. Um, and there is um, some useful dicta in a case called Mercury Tax v HMRC um, that shows that if you take advice on disclosure, this can offer um, a defence. So it's just worth remembering to put DOTAS IHT on your checklist when you're advising clients in relation to inheritance tax planning arrangements post 2018. Now, um, I want to leave some time, obviously, for questions. Oh, I'm not, not gone that quick. I've gone a bit too quick here. Oh. Well, I seem to have lost, I think, my slide at the end. I'm not quite sure what's happened there. I'm sorry, there should have been an, an additional slide. I'll leave it on the Mercury Tax one for the moment. Um, I'll make sure that it's um, on the, um, on the um, slides uh, that are sent out afterwards, if anyone wants it. It's just one very brief slide that mentions the position in relation to foreign domiciliaries. I suspect I probably deleted it by accident when I was um, trying to screen share. Um, but I just want to obviously mention the arena of foreign domiciliaries because this is very different to the type of planning that we've been talking about um, in relation to the residence nil rate band and in relation to some of the arrangements that were historically undertaken for UK resident domiciliaries. Um, I, I just want to mention, first of all, the revenues approach to foreign domiciliaries. It was really rather hoped, particularly in relation to clients that had been um, resident in the UK for a number of years and who then became deemed domiciled after the changes in the Finance Number no. 2 Act 2017, which obviously introduced the 15 out of 20 year test in relation to um, long term residents that um, the revenue would take um, a, a sort of more, more, um, a more measured approach in relation to the periods before um, the Finance Act um, 2017 came into effect in April 2017. And in fact, that hasn't turned out to be the case. In my experience, the revenue are still taking um, a very proactive and in some cases aggressive approach to investigating domicile. Um, one one um, client I heard um, term it as a war of attrition in relation to the documentation that's required. I absolutely understand HMRC's position in relation to information gathering. And in fact, in the 2008 changes, I, I went to, um, up to HMRC in Bootle um, to, to give them um, some teaching on, on the 2008 foreign domiciliary changes and in relation to domicile. And I understood the frustration that HMRC had uh, in relation to the sort of areas that they're asking questions and not being able to find or control um, the output of information in relation to certain taxpayers. Uh, the vast majority, in fact, all the taxpayers I see and all the accountants and solicitors that instruct me um, have an absolutely open policy with the revenue uh, and provide absolutely everything that they possibly can in response to domicile inquiries. Uh, the difficulties are often that the revenue are asking questions in relation to things that happened 20, 30, even maybe 40 years ago. Uh, and, you know, there may not be some documentary evidence. Um, the revenue also are more likely, I think, to use the benefit of the internet now and make searches and see what they can find from that perspective. So it's often worth making sure that that bit of due diligence has been done um, in advance of the um, in advance of the that the inquiry for, from the client's perspective. I'll just mention very very briefly a couple of cases. Uh, one is Henkes. It's worth looking at. It's um, it's interesting because it's the first recent case of a live taxpayer saying that he intended uh, not to end his days in the UK, um, which is the, the test at the moment that the Court of Appeal set down in IRC and Bullock, and the revenue um, uh, arguing that he had acquired a domicile of choice in the UK. It had some very interesting um, preliminary issues, um, and in fact neither the revenue or the taxpayer were very keen on the judge um, dealing with a substantive domicile issue that the, the judge did. And on balance, having found it very difficult, he decided against Mr. Henkes 
um, and that he had acquired a domicile of choice in the UK. Um, don't forget that the first tier tribunal decisions, as I said, um, are non-binding. If you have foreign domiciliary clients and if you have foreign domicile cases, they are not necessarily bound or covered by Henkes. And there are some definitely that some things that can be said about the decision. There are some criticisms that can be made in relation to the decision that was reached. There's also another uh, case called Imbericos that's just been heard in the um, upper tribunal. And that relates to the question as to whether um, the new procedure in section 29 um, A of the Taxes Management Act can be utilized in order for domicile to be a preliminary issue rather than um, having to give all of the, the figures um, and um, calculations that, that the revenue um, usually ask for um, at, at the outset of the domicile inquiry. Um, there were two cases, Empiricos at the first um, tier tribunal level decided that domicile could be a preliminary issue, question of law and fact without having to give the revenue all of the information. And then there was another case called Levy that went the other way. Levy isn't being appealed, but the upper tribunal have just looked at the issue in Empiricos. So that's worth mentioning. And then finally, obviously Schedule A1 to the Inheritance Tax Act 1984 and the look through for excluded property purposes for UK residential property if you have a foreign domiciled client is, is very, very um, important. Um, it, it would be a whole nother lecture in itself. And I just mention again, um, two things that may well be coming. We have a proposed registration of Overseas Entities Acts, which is going to be a beneficial ownership register um, of overseas entities that own UK properties. That's supposed to be coming in, in 2021. And of course, if you are looking at foreign domiciliaries who are wanting to buy um, residential property, then the FA 2021 is going to impose a 2% SDLT surcharge on non-UK residents who purchase UK residential property from the 1st of April next year. So there's a lot to think about in the, in the foreign domiciliary context, um, but that's just a little snapshot of what's um, entertaining, I think, the foreign domiciliary advisors at the moment. Well, I've um, probably gone on far too long as usual, um, but that, that's an encapsulation of all the issues. Um, I see we have some questions, and I'm going to invite Kevin to come back in as well now and unshare my screen so we can have a little look at the questions. Thank you very much. Um... Amanda, do you see do you see one uh, one or two there that you'd like to to kick off with? I think we have eight, and one of them I think was answered was, a, was about the sort of process and, and getting slides. Okay. Um, shall I? Shall I? Um, and I probably should have mentioned you cannot you can ask a question obviously anonymously. Um, you 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 can you can um, but of course some people have, have have asked with their names as well. So thank you very much. I probably should have mentioned you could do this. Um, a quick question at the end. I mentioned scrapping of capital gains tax on carried interest. That is in the Office of Tax Simplifications November 2020 report and obviously at present is only um, a recommendation. Um, uh, there's no suggestion yet that the Office of Tax Simplification recommendations are going to be picked up by the, by, by the government and by the Treasury, um, but that's what you need to look at. And I think it was published um, on the 5th of November, but it's the Office of Tax Simplification report. Um, so that's the first one. And the second, what actually happens when you notify an arrangement? Susanna, hello, um, under, uh, under DOTAS. Um, well, obviously, um, when you, if you, you have to put a, uh, you're effectively given a, a, a number <laughs> under the Finance Act 2004. Um, so you have to put on your tax return a disclosure um, or the return in relation to inheritance tax that, that you have um, undertaken arrangements that you think come within the DOTAS um, provisions. You're then likely, obviously, um, to get an inquiry. Um, from, from, from HMRC um, and um, then HMRC will consider whether or not they think that you actually are correct um, in relation to your um, assessment that they are or perhaps are not within DOTAS but have notified anyway. I, I'll just come back that, to that in a minute. Um, but from the inheritance tax perspective, um, it's, it's just effectively putting, putting it on your tax return and waiting for the revenue to come back. In relation to the wider DOTAS issues, um, because of course 
when it was introduced, it wasn't intended, as, as, as far as I can see, to cover things like inheritance tax and death. And actually, it, it's very difficult in most circumstances to marry the timetables that we have in relation to, um, in relation to inheritance tax and a DOTAS disclosure. Um, when do you start thinking um, that the arrangements that you've undertaken may be disclosable, for example? But there were, um, there were a number, I think, of, of arrangements that were if I can call it protectively notified when DOTAS first came into, into being. Um, and that's what I think turned out actually to be a, a mistake because you then fell within the DOTAS regime. You were then subject to the um, pe potential penalties and follower notices, accelerated payment notices, et cetera. And I think if you'd really concluded that DOTAS wasn't applicable, actually probably having the courage of, of one's convictions um, and relying on that advice was better for clients than putting them in a position where they'd fallen into the DOTAS regimes. Um, I, it has to be said, um, Susanna, for, for my own purposes, I wouldn't advise anyone to do arrangements that I, that I thought would fall within DOTAS for inheritance tax purposes, um, because I think it's just not not something that the clients really need to be involved in. So um, I'm, I'm afraid I, I haven't had anything where, where the revenue have followed up because I just advise, advise clients not to arrange their affairs in that way. Kevin, have you come across, across this from your perspective practically? Oh, I've certainly heard that um, you know, entering the lion's den, if you, if you like to be safe by, by your own design, is often bit you <laughs> by just entering the whole arena, as you say, being part of something that just goes and goes and goes. Um, I also think actually, fair enough, um, state and the other professional bodies now leaning to suggesting to their members that um, going through with things that are disclosable are likely to, you know, to raise the revenues, hackles and their treasury masters is, is slightly being more frowned on by the professions these days in terms of our own um, you know, rules and standards and ethics and what have you. There's a sea change that's happened over 10 years, hasn't it? That um, fancy tax avoidance that used to be dinner table conversation is, is, is frowned on by society, and I think that's all filtering through, and I, and I think these things were cleverly designed by Revenue and their Treasury Masters to get that, so I'm very much with you, Amanda, is that Nick, if you think it's going that way, think again completely about what you're doing and what your client really wants, and even if that client's for you. Yeah, yeah absolutely, and I think obviously, you know, from, from, from the professional perspective and from our own, for our own pr protection, as well, I think it's really, you know, it, it's now, now, now certainly at the point. Um, I saw somebody describe pre-2003 as the heyday of residential property planning um, techniques. Uh, and I, I, you know, as I said, I'm a, I, I hope that Ingram type arrangements, you know, blessed five nil by the, by, by the House of Lords would, wouldn't necessarily at that stage have been seen to be provocative. Um, but we're in a very different landscape now. Um, and, and I've certainly seen people raise, for example, the possibility um, of DOTAS um, in circumstances where there's been divorce or separation and, and there's been thought about inheritance tax saving arrangements as part of that. Um, in, in relation to that, I came to the conclusion that I didn't think it was something that was notifiable. And as I mentioned, I hope that that's um, an arena with the mercury tax um, uh, dicta that, that would give protection to the client if, if it came to it. Um, but I do think it needs to be on our checklist. But Kevin, you're quite right. I think if everyone um, uh, should, you know, is thinking that it's a real risk, then perhaps we should start again with a blank sheet of paper. I think now, you're absolutely right. Now I see it's at five past. I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to, to, to answer all the questions, but if anyone wants to drop an email to Step, um, afterwards, because I think the questions disappear. I'd obviously be very happy to respond to those after, but I understand that we need to be, you know, relatively strict about timing, particularly as so many of you have, have, have obviously listened just to me talking for quite a long time, which I know can be quite tiring on Zoom. Not, not, not at all, not at all. Um, well, Amanda goes without saying thank you ever so much um, for I thought a very, very splendid presentation to us and for sharing your wisdom on this amazingly topical subject, and always has been, and just always will be. And thank you to all of you um, for, for coming along and attending. And thank you particularly to some unsung heroes in, in the background making these things happen. They don't happen by themselves. I can assure you I've tried and it doesn't. Um, so Lizzie, uh, Bob and Veronica and, and all your team, thank you very much for arranging it and, and making sure it all went very smoothly, which it certainly seemed to where, where I'm sitting.
Um, you will be getting an online um, evaluation form tomorrow, um, and with also a link to the recording of this, and I, and I suspect the slides as well. Um, do complete that. I mean, we, we do thrive on feedback to keep these things, you know, going in the right direction. And I suspect also there's a great bit of evidence for your CPD, if your professional body ever, ever gets too um, deep with you on that. Um, please do look out for your emails from um, London Central for details of the next event. Um, it's coming out shortly, um, thanks to Mike on my committee and his team there for, for doing all of this. Well, thank you very much. And, and Amanda, again, wonderful. Thank you. Pleasure as always. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody.